pronouns and demonstratives are gonna are, are pretty easy so I may just I may not I'm not going to address them tonight but I may just leave them um, and then jump into verbs next I, I'm I'm really contemplating taking a break so I'll let you know where I'm going with that but um, I want to get into to verbs at least get into lesson eight get us started in that give some things that we can get working on um, but these these are the last sections that that relate to cases and that so um, I wanted to look at them together, but we'll focus on pronouns tonight. I go back and I I'll, wanted to review a little bit about prepositions. And I want to just show you some, uh, go back and look at some more passages and just challenge you to, as much as you can, use your Greek text. But I'm going to show you some things that it, to look for, not just, not just for the, the grammatical structures, but also the literary structures that happen. And I'll show you one of them from Philippians. Um, <clears throat> but one of the nice things about the way that the Greek language is, is that it helps you to discern those a little bit more easily. And Paul uses very uh, Hebrew ways of writing, the types of literary structures as he writes. Um, and so we'll look at some of that tonight. But just keep your eyes open because oftentimes the, the grammatical aspect will help point that out for you. And... Uh, and hopefully that you'll get some richness out of it as we walk together. There's several passages, so I have, you know, set up a bunch of examples from different passages. Um, if you want to turn in your text to Ephesians, I think this is probably where the first place we'll start. But I want to look at, at prepositions <clears throat> and sort of review a little bit and go back and look at them. Um, <clears throat> and again, when you're looking at prepositions, you want to understand that their root meanings. And then from there, we, we can branch out and their relationship to cases and that and how they function. But with the, the complexity of thought, the, the, the ideas that the Greeks wanted to communicate and express, all of a sudden realize that cases weren't enough. There was need for something more than. And, and this is a beautiful aspect of the process that, that took place. So they developed their own prepositional system. And they started from adverbs and then carried over into prepositions and they stand as prepositions and they are they can stand separate they don't have to be joined to words but they are often joined to word and I showed you last time how you can have a a verb you can have a, a prefix preposition on the front of it and then you'll have the preposition follow it and I'll show you a, a great example from Philippians where Paul does this and this phrase is unparalleled in the New Testament unparalleled you would totally miss it in English but there is no other phrase like it in the New Testament. And the word that he uses, it's what we call hapax legomena. It is spoken once. In other words, likely Paul coined the term. And, and there are a few of those in Paul's writings where he just cannot find a term sufficient enough that he makes one up. And you won't find it in any extent writings. You won't find it anywhere else in Scripture, only in his, his writing. And so we'll look at one of those phrases uh, tonight in Philippians 3. But there's just such great wealth that lies beneath our English translation. So the more that you can get in there and start sort of dabbling with it, the better off you will be. So as much as you can have your Greek text with you, whether you're listening to messages or what have you, just go there. I mean, even if you can pick out one term or two, the better off you'll be. So we have 17 prepositions in Greek. There are, there are several others, but they, they fluctuate between the, the preposition adverbs. And even you'll see that there are, are still this connection between some of the prepositions and their function as an adverb. But there are 17 primary ones that we look at. Amphi is one, but the only time we ever find it in the Greek text is in composition. It's always connected to a word. It never stands alone, so we don't normally deal with it. But it's, it's there just so you know. And I started working on a, on a whole chart on prepositions, dealing with the roots and all that, and I just stopped a ways through. I, maybe I'll finish it one of these days, but there's just so many other things to do. So interpreting prepositions, several things to keep in mind. The, the basal meaning of the preposition, what is the root meaning? Because usually when it's in composition, when it's put together with another term, if it's prefixed to it and that, it's, it's pretty much going to go back to its root meaning. 
And if you don't know the root, then sometimes the, the connections will be missed and you'll be wondering, well, what's going on here? So again, when you're looking at the vocabulary, look at the, the definition, the bracket, learn that first, and then the, the, the resultant meanings you can develop later. The other thing to keep in mind is the case form with which it is used. So whatever case it, it comes with in the text, note that case. Make careful attention to it. And some of them are pretty clear. We have apa, which is off and away from, and it usually occurs with the ablative case, the case of separation. So those connections are, are pretty simple, but some of them get a little bit more complex. So just keep that in mind. Then the third thing is the particular usage in the given context. Context is always crucial, always. Have to go back there and weigh everything by that. So those are the three things when interpreting prepositions. Keep those things in mind. Basic meaning, case form that it's used with, and then the particular usage in the context. Prepositions can be prefixed to a term, and it can add a new idea. And we'll, we'll see one case where we have two different prepositions used on the front of a word in, in Philippians 3. And one is a very nice term and the other one is a very brutal term. But you'll see how the preposition brings this out. The other is to modify. Sometimes it's giving some new, sort of direction to the term that is being used or it can intensify. <clears throat> And these you'll, you'll learn as you go along. The more that you develop your vocabulary, the more that you'll know. But for these, it's the context that helps bring that out. So when you see a, a preposition prefix to a term, start looking around the context, and that will help you determine how it's being utilized in, in that particular passage. So going back to our root meanings then, we have anti, or, or actually pra, which is before. So in Ephesians, we find this very often, but it's used with terms that talk about the eternal purpose of God, the prothesis. Tha is to put our place. Sis is the act of, and then pra before, going back to eternity past. So you'll find that we were predestined, right? This is prefixed with pra. When it looks at the, the good works that, that God had prepared beforehand in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we have the preposition pra, which he did before the foundation of the world. So when God chose us, he predestined us, he also predestined good deeds that we would walk in them. Right? So everything from beginning to end, when you look at salvation, is all of grace. Right? All of grace, without a doubt. Um, <clears throat> next is pros, near or facing, or face to face, is how I normally translate it. Uh, anti is also face to face, but is more uh, with the idea of over and against. Um, and usually it's used in the sense of opposition, like the Antichrist, right? Um, so it usually is used in the context of opposition, but not always. Like, if you look at my meditation on the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, this preposition is used anti, but it's not in a negative way, it's a positive one. And again, context will, will determine that for you. We have ace, which is within or in. We have that idea and, and present it with an arrow because it's the idea of movement, right? We're going to, so normally I translate it unto, And you'll find that in most of my translations, I do that because I want to convey the idea of movement. But there is sometimes we call the present, the, the pregnant understanding of it, where there's movement and then there's the point of rest. You finally get there. I walked into the house and I'm there and now I'm in the house. And so it can have this, this full meaning to it. And it's interesting that in... So this preposition here used in Colossians chapter 1 when it talks about God reconciling all things to himself, we translate the phrase as a reflexive. Reconcile all things to himself. We translate like it's a reflexive pronoun, but it isn't. But this preposition is used. So it carries the movement of the verb and it brings that movement to him which is in the, which is in the accusative case. So he has reconciled all things and have this ace unto himself. And it gives that reflexive sense. But it's interesting because the, this, the verb form is an aorist. In other words, it's happened in, the, it's happened in the past. We usually, for a historical statement, this happened. But it's intriguing that he uses that historical statement, sort of this punctiliary act, it happened, but then he uses it with this preposition of movement. In other words, it happened, but the results are still being carried on. So there are a lot of different nuances to these prepositions. So it's good to have that visual aspect of understanding the movement that's involved there because it, the context then, there are elements that are brought out because of those 
trues. Then we have peri, which is around. So we have perimeter that we get in English. And we'll see this when we'll talk about circumcision, the cutting around, as opposed to the katatame, which is not a good thing. Then we have through dia, which was from dua, which is two. <clears throat> we have hupa, which is under. And oftentimes we'll have this in the sense of that there was something sent out like, uh, you know, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. We'll have hupa. In other words, under the authority of, right? But sometimes it'll be translated from. And it's sort of an anemic translation, right? But then when you see, a, it's under the authority of, right? And so you, it, it brings to life the passage. So start thinking along those lines if you can. Kata, down. We have N, which is within, like our preposition in in English. We have Ana, which is up from Ano, the adverb, the upward things in Colossians 3.1. We have Huper, which is over. So when Christ gave himself for our sins, who pair on behalf of, right? He covered us with his sacrifice of his life. We have epi, which is upon. So one of my favorite passages talking about in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we labor and strive towards godliness because, he says, our hope stands in the state of epi, resting upon God, Right? And so there's such a, this is great preaching from prepositions. If you can master them and understand them, this is great stuff there. And as much as Hebrew is a pictorial language, Greek is as well. When you start to understand some of these elements of the language, there's a lot of imagery that's brought out. Then we have para, which is alongside of or beside. <clears throat> we have ek, which is out of or from within. And oftentimes, ek will reflect coming out of the sphere of something into something new. So again, notice the arrow. So we have this movement that's involved with ek. So it is the contrast of ace. Ace is moving into the sphere of something. Ek is moving out of the sphere of something. And this is the preposition we'll see tonight dealing with the resurrection. Out from among the dead ones, right? So... Paul is going to visually just bring before our mind's eye of being raised up out from among the dead, from out of the ground, right? As he talks about the resurrection. And then we have apa, which is off or away from. And again, happens with the ablative case, case of separation. Meta, which is in the midst of. But we will find meta is translated with. Okay. So that 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 one will definitely throw you when you find it in other in other contexts, and sometimes it's translated after, but in the midst of, and then soon together with, and this is the most intimate preposition. So Sunday when I was preaching, going through talking about the the unity, the focus of God's uh, cosmic purpose, reconciling of all things. There are so many terms throughout Ephesians where they're prefixed with soon, over and over. Whether it's our relationship to Christ or our relationship to each other, they're all prefixed with soon. In other words, there is this intimate joining together of ourselves with Christ and also ourselves with each other. And it runs through the whole book. And, and I went through and showed how these expressions sort of bolster that overriding theme of unity that runs through Ephesians. So definitely when we think about prepositions, there's something that you need to master as a student. There's a lot of theology, a lot of good doctrine, and we'll see that tonight in some of the examples. But there's just a lot of great uh, illustrations and, and pictorial elements to them if you can master them. So Ephesians 1, here's what's interesting. This is a, a series of, of the same prepositional phrase, and it is page 6. Uh, 54 in your Greek text, but Ephesians 1, and I, this is interesting because he, he piles the same prepositional phrase up, it is the preposition N, and I would normally translate in the sphere of. <clears throat> so here's the first phrase, and it is in passe, in every eulogia, blessing, pneumatike, which is spiritual. So in every spiritual blessing. So he 
moves from one to the next. So he, he talks about the fact that here is, Blessed be the God and Father to Kuryu Heimon. This is, a, this is a possessive genitive. This is great Trinitarian truth right here, right? Doctrine of the Trinity. The Father of, right, of the Lord. Possessive genitive. It is the Lord's Father. Great truth for the doctrine of Trinity. Then Hamon, this, so this is confessional, but this is also a possessive genitive. He is our Lord. It's a confessional statement, and usually this is the ordering of Paul. The Lord of us, and then he has Jesus Christ, right? He could have put, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ of us and put Hamon at the end, but normally he does it this way. It's a confessional statement. The Lord of us, possessive genitive, he is our Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, right? So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us. Notice the ha goes back to ha te'os, right? So this is talking about what he has done for us, who blessed us, right? In every blessing spiritual, in the heavenly places, in Christo, in Christ. So he just builds this prepositional phrase, and he just stacks one upon the other. But the first one is essentially, it's just comprehensive. It summarizes everything that we have as believers, and he just sums it up in this one great statement of blessing. This is what we have, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And then he starts to unfold it in Ephesians, right? But it's such a blanket statement that he gives us. And, and verse 3 really is the, the opening for the rest of these verses going down to verse 14. But everything in the letter is going to build off of this first doxology. So then he moves to the next one, in the heavenly places, plural form, this is used five times, and the only place this phrase occurs is in Ephesians, nowhere else. And I just tell you, to read back, read through Ephesians sometime and, and keep this in mind, but notice the plural, in the heavenly places. But go back and read through some of the statements that Paul makes. The, the idea of the scope of the heavens, right? And then he takes it the next step and he says, which is in Christ. And this particular phrase occurs over 30 times in this epistle. This is a favorite phrase of Paul's. So essentially he just takes all of this, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, they are then ultimately then in Christ. And this is the locative case indicating that believers are incorporated in who is in the heavenly realm, and therefore what is stated of Christ can also be stated of believers as well. And that really is the first three chapters of Ephesians, is our position in Christ, everything that we have in Him. So Christ is the place in whom or in the sphere of whom the blessings are bestowed from God. So He just built, and then He's just going to unfold. But just tell you, with Ephesians, Paul just, everything about is superlative. He could have just stopped with the first phrase, right? Every spiritual blessing. And he could have left it at that. But he just takes it the next step, then the next step. He does that through the whole letter. It is one of those letters that just everything about it is transcendent. You read through the letter and there's fullness everywhere. And there's blessing everywhere. And there's richness everywhere. And I always tell people, that there's no way you can read this letter and be depressed. It's impossible. But everything about it is transcendent. It's otherly. It's out of this world. It's beyond this world. So if you're going to get into it, this is how Paul starts off. And he takes us to the superlative. And he pushes everything beyond the temporal realm. So the things that he is going to contemplate, he starts off with the first verse. He tells us automatically with verse 3, with these three statements, that everything I'm going to talk about is beyond the normal human conceptions. I'm going to go beyond time. I'm going to go to eternity past, to eternity future. I'm going to go beyond the normal material things and the things that normally consume our minds. I'm going to go to the spiritual realm where reality really is. And he just starts us off with these three prepositional phrases. But awesome for the letter. He takes us to a realm that uh, most of us don't really journey to in our Christian life. Philippians 3. So let me show you some, some prepositions here. So if you go to Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> we know this passage pretty well. So in our mind's eye, we can... Did you say there's only 17 prepositions? So there's, there's 17 key prepositions in, in Greek. But there, there are other ones, but these are the ones that, that are majority of the time that are used, and they, are, they can be separate, but they can also be prefixed to something else. Other ones sort of fluctuate between the adverb and a preposition, so they're not just locked in as 
prepositions. So these 17 are looked at as being solely prepositional. <clears throat> but there are, there are others. There are others. So this one's interesting. So in Philippians, uh, in your Greek text, 678, and we'll look at verses 12 and following, but this is interesting because he uses the preposition kata through here in, in several different terms. But notice in chapter, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of, translated in NASB, false circumcision. But that's not the term that's in the Greek text. So you have peritame. Peri is the preposition to cut around. So that is a very pleasant term, right? So when you circumcise someone, there's, there's skill indicated by peri. You're careful, you're, you're precise. But then when you prefix tame to cut, with kata, down, right? This is a hacking, this is a chopping, this is mutilation, right? So this is what he really calls them. He calls them the mutilators. And I'll just tell you, there, there are several terms in here. One of them you probably have heard several times in messages. Sometimes we're afraid to say things, but just let the text say it. But there's some pretty tough things. I mean, like Paul says in Galatians, you know, those who are hindering the believers there, and he says, would it be that they would make themselves eunuchs, right? Would they castrate themselves? It's a hard terminology, but our English translations kind of smooth it over. But we miss the, the, the impact, right? When you understand Galatians is about preserving the purity of the gospel, there's just one, right? I mean, he, he calls them foolish, Right? He says, who bewitched you? He says of the false teachers, I wish they'd go out and just mutilate themselves, right? castrate themselves. You get a sense of the urgency and, and the necessity for maintaining the purity of the gospel. But when we smooth those things over, right, and we read them in English, it's kind of just la-di-da, no big deal. right? So we miss the, the severity of what's going on. Uh, so this is one of those times where Paul's pretty severe. He does not use a different expression and use the polite term for circumcision. He uses katatame, those who are hacking, those who are chopping you to bits, right? They're the mutilators. <clears throat> I remember I was reading through Ezekiel 16. So I was telling a friend of mine when I was teaching the seminary overseas, and we were talking, and I said, man, I was reading through Ezekiel 16. I said, man, the things that God says there are just harsh, man. So I was telling him some of the things that he's like, no. There's no way that God said that. I said, go read it for yourself. And so I see him the next day. He's like, dude, I cannot believe God said that, man. But it's true. He said it, and it's, it's harsh. <clears throat> so here's another one, the preposition ek. So Paul is referring to his heritage, his, his lineage, and he refers to himself as a hebraos ex hebraon. And literally is just a Hebrew out of Hebrews, plural form. So he, he's showing the purity of his lineage. Both mother and father are, are pure Hebrew, and I am pure Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew out of Hebrews. In chapter 3, verse 11, this is the phrase. So he says in English, he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so that's how it's translated. So notice that I put unto because we have the preposition ace there. So here's the preposition ace. So I translate unto the resurrection from the dead. But this phrase, it's unparalleled in the New Testament. There's no other phrasing like this, the, the whole thing altogether. But at the same time, this is what we refer to as a hepax legomenon, that which is spoken once. This is the only place it occurs in all the New Testament, is right here. And Paul is talking about the eschatological bodily resurrection that is to come. But, he, oh man, this messed it up. All right, so, I don't know why that changed. But notice, here's our preposition. So my line was supposed to be under here. This is what I get for doing ahead. So here's the preposition, ek, okay, out, out from. He prefixes it on the front of this word here, ex. And because it begins with a vowel, this kappa becomes xi, okay? So he prefixes is here, and remember I showed you before, you can have the, the prefix preposition on the front of a verb and then follow it again. So here he does that here, and then he follows it here. And it is the tain ek necron, out of the dead ones. 
So essentially, Paul is talking about the fact of being raised out from among the dead ones. So he is stressing the rising out from the earth. And it's a very vivid picture of rising out from the earth, right? This bodily resurrection that is going to take place in the future. So not only does he, he coin a word that's not used anywhere else, but he uses this double emphasis with the preposition to, to see. So we, I mean, this is a great thing about Hebrew and Paul brings it into Greek. It's meant to be experiential, not just to see it, no, but to experience that, right? So this is what is going to happen, is that we are going to be raised up out of the ground, and our bodies then are going to be joined with the soul. But it's going to be a resurrection body. Amazing stuff. I mean, we just sit here and preach on that one phrase right there. So 314, Paul's going to carry on this, this thought of the preposition kata, and he's going to run through here. And we know the passage well, right? I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so this is how he begins the, the verse, verse 14, kata, skapan. And skapan is used in the, in the uh, Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, for the Hebrew term matara, which is the point at which the archer aims, Okay. So, if you can, if you use the imagery, this is from track and field because they had Olympic Games in that back in those days. So, track and field, you have the finish line, right? Usually, there's some sort of marker that indicates this is the end of it. So, this is what he's looking at, that, the final goal that we're going to reach towards. But notice how he has this on the front of it, kata skapan. So, how do we have translate in English? He says, I press on toward. But... It's more this. So this is how I translated it, bearing down upon, right? You see in the passage, which Paul keeps using, you see this exerted force on his part of moving towards that final ultimate goal, right? So then when he talks about, I forget what lies behind, that's the negative and the positive things, and I keep pressing on, I've got myself fixed on the goal, and I'm striving towards that, right? And so it's a great image of, of the Christian life. So he carries this through the passage and all of the terms, the verbs, he's going to prefix them with kata. So he says in verse 12 of chapter 3, he says, not that I've already obtained to it. So this is the first one, not that I've already obtained to it or I have already become perfect, but this is what I do. I press on so that I may lay hold of for that which I've already been laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So this is the first occurrence, that which I may lay hold of. So this is the root right here, the trilateral root lob. It is to take hold of, to receive in some cases, but here it is to take hold of, and then kata, down upon. Man, this is, this is, I'm after that. I want this thing. I'm laying down on it. So you see in this passage, and Paul is bringing it to the kind of effort that we should be giving to our Christian life, right? So I tell people, you can't just sort of kick back in that spiritual lazy boy and put your feet up. Right? It's passages like this that keep us pressing on towards heaven. He just keeps thrusting us forward. And that kata, down upon, down upon, he just keeps us moving forward. So he talks about the fact that we've been laid hold upon, right, for Christ's sake. And I'm going to keep seeking to lay hold upon that. And then same thing in verse 13 of chapter 3. Brethren, not that I regard myself as having already laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. So everything in it, he just keeps pressing, pressing, pressing. So you see that athlete, right? If you know anything about track and field, I, I grew up around Biola University. My, my uncle was track coach and uh, literary professor. All my aunts and uncles taught there. My dad taught the seminary. But I'd go to the track and field competitions, and you get these guys that run around track, right? And they're just sprinting dead, and they come down to that final stretch, and they're just exerting everything. You get down that, that finish line, and they're straining everything, right, to cross that line. This is the imagery that Paul is bringing out in this text as he uses these terms. It's just showing that straining to go towards that final ultimate prize at the end, right? And so when you then stop and look at this, you look at your Christian life and go, well, how hard do I exert myself towards holiness, right, and godliness, right? And how hard am I pressing towards heaven, right? But he, notice how he just takes his preposition kata down upon, and he just uses it all the way through this text to keep it moving. 
So there's great theological truth here, but there, there's great imagery as far as our, our Christian life is concerned. So when we can master these things, uh, it'll take you a long ways. Here's two more verses in Philippians 3, 8, and 9. This I want to show you because it's, it's, the, it's not just the, the prepositions that are here, but it's the structure of it. So I'll forgo reading it. You guys know the passage, right? 8 and 9. So here is verse 9. I'm going to isolate it for you. But this is verse 9. And I'm just going to tell you to, to look. Okay? So notice this here. This is right, the term righteousness. Okay? Notice the ain ending. Okay? Notice this right here. This is the article, tain. Okay? So this looks back to this. Righteousness, the righteousness out of the law. Okay? But it's negated up here, but we'll see that later. So notice this, tain. This also looks back to righteousness. See how these connect? So this goes to righteousness. This goes to righteousness. The righteousness, which is through faith in Christ. Okay? Notice this one, tain. Ek, theu, right? Or theu, if we say it right. Tain. This goes down to here, right? Same word, righteousness. So you see that? That, that those forms for the cases, right? They connect these words for us. So let me show you this verse visually what it looks like. So here's verse 9. And this is how we lay it out. It's what we call in chiastic structure. So they, in Hebrew, they do this. They'll give you, you know, two or three themes, even more. You have a whole entire book in the Old Testament that's a whole chiastic structure. Philemon is actually a chiastic structure in the New Testament. So they'll, they'll give you two or three themes or more, and then they'll reverse them, put them in reverse order. So let me show you what happens here. So not having my own, okay? And the contrast is upon faith. So one is out of myself, and the other one is by faith. Now, <laughs> righteousness is meant by righteousness. Okay, so here's where it gets interesting. So not having my own righteousness, the out of the law righteousness, okay? So then he's going to contrast it with a righteousness, the out of God righteousness. And again, notice this, Tain, this goes down to righteousness. So you have a righteousness, the righteousness out of ek namu, out of the law, okay? So notice the middle part, but that which is through faith in Christ. So the whole verse is not having my own righteousness, the out of the law kind of righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ, the out of God righteousness upon faith. Okay? So here's prepositional phrases. Out of, not the out of the law, right? But out of the God. Through faith, the epistels, through faith in Christ. So the first two prepositions, which are exactly the same, deal with source. My righteousness is not from the law, the source of the law. My source for my righteousness is from God. And it is mediated, what? Through faith in Christ Jesus. So look not just to the, the relationships, right? The grammatical aspect, but start to look at structure. And you'll find this often with Paul. Luke is very good at it, although he's a Gentile. His, 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 Luke and Acts is actually one giant geographical chiastic structure. Both books put together. But he has it running through there. But it's great truth, right? Awesome stuff. This is prepositions. See, now this is why I like staying on prepositions. So this is new stuff, all right? Well, let's see how far we get. If you don't get all the way, I'm not, I'm not dying. So particles. Love particles. Particles are good things. If you stay in your, in your English and Greek text in Ephesians, we will go there. i got some examples for you. So particles. We get down to like the smallest aspect now of, of Greek. I mean, beyond just theory with the mere letters. Particles are those little tiny things, oftentimes just two letters, but they're significant. So particles comes from the Latin meaning small part. These are the, the little terms in the Greek grammar. These terms do not fit within the context of like categories like nouns, verbs, adjectives, they're sort of like their own little thing, little tidbits, but they're important tidbits. And I'll give you one because I actually was preaching on Sunday and a brother said, after the message, he says, you know, I, I had this question and you answered it before I could even ask it. 
And he says, and I saw that, and I wonder, why did they translate? And, he's, and his first impression was he thought that the translators translated the, the particular word wrong, but not so. But by the time I finished, he, he saw the point of it. So particles are usually used for such things as emphasis, transition from one idea to another, or to express the negative, okay? So I'm going to give you some examples, but these are the three main areas in which they're used. Particles are used for transition, for emphasis, Right? Transition from one thing to another for emphasis and also to express the negative, which we have negative particles. We have ooh and may. Okay? Those are two negative particles. And later I'll show you how they're used in negative clauses. So you can have double negatives, like John the Baptist, when it talks about the fact that no, no liquor will touch his mouth, he uses a double negative, ooh may. He absolutely will not consume alcohol. Right? It's, this is unique to John. This is his role. He will not do that. And so you can have a double negative. And the negatives have different significances of them because ooh has the idea of reality. And the other one, potentiality. We'll get into that later. So even the particles, there's, there's significance to the which one is used and so on. And I'll, I'll show you one from uh, 2 Timothy because this is an interesting one. Because 2 Timothy, they're, I mean, commentaries, I read them and they're like, they're just slamming Timothy. You see, he was ashamed, and they go on this whole thing, right? And they preach this whole sermon on how Timothy was ashamed and all this stuff. It's not even what the Greek grammar is saying. It's not saying he was that. Paul was telling him not to enter into that, right? So he wasn't accusing him of it. He was just telling him, don't ever go there. This is a difference, right? So you hear these messages. I read these commentaries. I'm like, where does this guy get this stuff from, right? Try looking at the Greek, would you? Because that's not what it's saying. All right, so particles are awesome, and they tell us a lot. And the, one of the, the big ones we find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, which we know well, right? So Paul describes our past degenerate life. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which we formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now working, sons of disobedience. And he goes on in verse 3, Among them also we formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging desires of flesh and of the mind. Then in verse 4 he says, But God, this is it, de. This is that, that major turning point, right? But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And then this leads into our salvation and what God did. If there isn't the but God, there's no change. All right? There's no change. There has to be a but God. Has to be. A friend of mine, missionary, and he was, he had this mentality of missions was that he, if he did everything right, set the right atmosphere, played the right songs, all of that, that he could lead someone to salvation. So then if he didn't do that, then somehow he did something wrong. Till he came to Ephesians 2. He realized, because he was thinking in fishing terms, right? If I bait the hook and put the right bait on, I can catch. Then he realized you can't bait a dead fish. There has to be a but God. You don't have life without a supernatural interaction. Cannot be. And this is the importance of the death, right? But God. And there's a different, uh, uh, another one, Allah, which is also even more emphatic. So there's de, which can be translated but, and also now, but it translated but, and then you have Allah. Now, this passage, we know we translate it not now, but, but because there is a contrast between our past and our present experience, right? So context also tells you how to translate the particle, because you could translate it now, God being enriched, right? But you take away that emphatic statement. When you look at the context, context tells you to translate it, but not now, right? It's more than just transitional, okay? <clears throat> so again, context is everything. Ephesians 4, 7. So this was the one the brother had a question about. This is interesting because I, I was reading this and then all of a sudden he's like, well, why do they do that? So, but, verse 7 of chapter 4, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Is dead. Why not translate it now? Why not merely just transitional? Why but? What is it contrasting? It's contrasting verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It contrasts the all. The first few verses is talking about unity that we maintain. And he's looking at this corporate dimension. 
But then he wants to show us that we don't leave out the idea of the, the personal or the individual. And in verses 7 through 16, he's going to talk about the diversity in the body of Christ. So there's unity and there is diversity. So this is the proper translation. But to each one of us, and the each one brackets this. He starts off verse 7 with each one, and he ends verse 16 with each one. If you look at your Greek text, it's translated each individual, but if you look at your Greek text, it's the same wording, each one, each one. So it brackets this whole section. So it is, it is adversative. It's not merely transitional. So out of this, I had this, this thought about the church. The, the church is an assembly in which the individual does not get lost in the community, nor the community lost in the individual. You must maintain both of those. It is a community life, but you also have to remember that the community is made up of individual people, and you have to keep that balance. And that's where the thought for me came from was the contrast between 6 and 7. So the, the particles are, are important, and they tell us a lot. So going back, the, the, the particle de is post-positive. This means it can't stand first in a sentence. It always has to come second, okay? It, it can't stand in a, a, first in a sentence or in a clause, so it's always going to take second place. And sometimes it might appear in third place, but normally it's going to come in second place. And in order to avoid standing first in a sentence or a clause, de will even stand between an article and its noun. So here's an example from Romans chapter 1, verse 17. So here is my article, we know the phrase, but the righteous by faith will live, okay? So here is the article, ha, and it goes with my noun here, dikaios, right? And notice where the de is, right between them, okay? So just remember that, that if you see the de between an article and that, remember that article and noun go together, okay? They go together, and then you, you're looking at an articular form, not just in an arthurist form, right? So just keep in mind, the dead will go between the article and the noun that, that it goes with, and it'll split them up. And you'll find this a lot, a lot, when you start walking through the Greek text. So this is dead, and there's a lot of ways in which... So here, I'll show you one. This is cool. 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> give you a tip on 1 Corinthians, the structure of it. So if you go 1 Corinthians chapter 7, let's show you something. And, and all translations, they don't always carry it out, which is really unfortunate. It'd be nice if they did that. Like in Genesis, you have Toledoth, these are the generations of, and translations won't translate the same. It's the same phrase every time, but they'll, you know, these are the, you know, so-and-so, or this is this, and they'll do it, each one different, but it's that constant refrain that always run, runs through Genesis. So notice with me, in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, he, in English, now concerning. So it's peri de. It's a preposition, and then our particle de, Okay. Here's what's interesting about this. This is the first time it occurs right here in, in chapter 7, verse 1. Now, notice what Paul talks about here. He says, now concerning the things about which you wrote. Okay? So he is going to address the first thing in the issue of marriage. Every time Paul, from this point on, starts a new section, it begins with peri de. Okay? So, I'll just tell you this. So, 7-1. Now concerning, okay? That runs all the way to the end of chapter 7. Notice chapter 8, verse 1. English has now concerning. This is our Greek phrase, peride, okay? That starts in 8, 1. That section runs all the way to the end of chapter 11. The next now concerning is chapter 12, verse 1. So chapter 8 through 11 is one block of material. That's the context. You have to figure out how all of that stuff fits together, but that's all one context. It's all connected. And I'll tell you, it all has to do with liberty in Christ, our Christian liberty, those chapters. So then 12 starts with now concerning, 12.1, now concerning spiritual gifts. That covers 12, 13, and 14. 
Because in 15.1, he's going to say, Now I want to make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach you. And he's going to deal with the resurrection. Okay? So from 12 to 14, spiritual gifts. What's nice about that is when you look at 12 and 14, you have spiritual gifts in 12, spiritual gifts in 14, 13, love. It's a sandwich, right? All three chapters go together. If you want to understand the full thrust of what's going on there, you have to see the context. That's the particle, de, right, with the preposition. So that particle will tell you a lot, right? Emphatic, transitional, right? It even determines context. So those little guys, don't negate them. And it's unfortunate because a lot of translations, a lot of those little things like that, those little terms, a lot of translations won't translate them. Right? Like here's one that frustrates me. Idu. Okay, behold. Right? So John, Gospel of John, the new updated NASB, you have it, Gospel of John, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. They keep that. In Luke and Acts, they don't have it anywhere. Idu. That is, a, that is a literary device that Luke uses all the time in Luke and Acts. You find in the Greek. And he does it for a reason. It's his way of drawing our attention to something specific. So Sunday I'm going to be preaching, dealing with Titus, or Timothy. In, in Acts 16, he's going to behold a disciple. His name is Timothy. He wants us to see Timothy and to focus on him because something important. He's going to tell us about him, and it's about him joining the band with Paul. He's going to come alongside of him and do ministry work. But they don't translate it. It's totally unfortunate because there are key things that Luke says, I want you to see this and don't miss it, that because they don't translate English, we would read over and think this is a non-significant thing. When he's halting our attention and saying, don't miss this. And likely things that we would just blow over. Well, so what about this guy, right? It's unfortunate. So look for those little things. All right, the negative particles, there are a few of them that we have, ooh, ook. Uk with the, the rough, and also we have me. So here's a case with, with me, and this is 2 Timothy 1.8, and you don't have to turn there, but Paul says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony. Do not be ashamed of the testimony, maturion, to kuryu, of the Lord, of us, right? Here's our confessional again, right? The Lord, hemon, of us, a confessional statement. Nor of me, the prisoner, tan desmion, out to of him. So this negative particle here that goes with this verb here, to be ashamed. He's not saying that Timothy is ashamed. He's telling him, don't ever become ashamed. If he used the, the part negative particle, ooh, right, like up at the top here, if he used this negative particle or this one here, right, he would be affirming the fact that he is ashamed. And he would also use a present tense. In other words, he'd be saying, stop being that way, right? You need to knock that off. So there are a lot of times in Paul's writing, when he's writing, to the church, you need to knock this off. And he uses that negative particle, which is reality. You're doing this plus present tense. Here he uses meh, and he uses it with an aorist. In other words, don't enter into this. Don't ever become ashamed. He's not saying that he is. So again, there's a lot of bad sermons. He's nailing Timothy for no reason. If you actually look at his life in Scripture, he's a faithful man. He went through a lot of stuff with all the ailments and everything he dealt with. And yes, he had a timid spirit and he was a little bit retiring. But that brother went into some seriously difficult situations and straightened him out for Paul. Right? So you, you paint the guy in a bad light. So the negative particles make a difference. And later we'll, we'll see how they're used and, and the significance of that. Here's a compounded form in Philippians 4, 6. So... Here it is, on the front is meiden. And here we translate, do not be anxious, right, about anything. This is absolutely never. Don't ever be anxious. Don't ever be anxious about anything, right? So these are different uh, negative particles, and so we can have a combination. And this is a combination of a few particles. So like in, in Luke's gospel, he has like three of them combined together. And it's a unique term. You only find it in archaic writings, old writings, which he's making a point. He is writing on the level of a historian. Okay? So just tell you that. So you can have several particles that can be combined together to make a term. 
And if you know the meaning of each of those particles, there's a significance to each one. And if you'd like to, I'll give you my exegetical work on Luke on the first four verses, and, and you'll see it's, it's awesome stuff, but we don't see it in English. All right, pronouns. So let's get into pronouns, and we'll see how far we get. So the pronoun is the place of noun, uh, a device of language utilized to prevent monotony or the multiplication of the noun. So instead of saying the, the you know, God, God, God over, you know, someone prays all the time, Lord, 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 right? We can just say him, right? This is change things up. So this is a, a main reason for pronouns and how they're used. But there's different ways for emphasis. There's reflexive, right? So let me get through the classifications of them and see how far we can get along here. So they're used to prevent undue repetition of the substantive or an adjective. However, sometimes the repetition of the substantive is poignant. So in John chapter 11, verse 22, Martha says to Jesus, Whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Right? So could have said, He will give you. Right? But the, the focus is, the point is to, to make the double emphasis on the fact of God. Now, this is interesting. That whatever, whatever you ask, I tell you, say, whatever you ask, tante on of God, dose, he. So this is the subject right here. He, these last two letters tell me, he to you, the God will give. So could have just left this off the end. He will give to you. And you would understand the, the subject here is that on. But this is added on to the end of it. Ha teos. Right? So remember, this is the nominative case, so it helps to name, right? The nominative case is the naming case. It names more specifically the subject. So she's making the emphasis here. Whatever you ask of the God, he to you will give the God. Right? So, so when you, you understand that they can use pronouns and break up the monotony, then if there is the double statement like this, stop and ask yourself why. What's the point? Right? What's the point of that? <clears throat> uh, Indo-European pronominal roots are very old. Some of them are as old as the, the oldest verbal roots. The pronominal is the subject that, that comes at the end of the, of the verb stem, like do se. Um, but this is where the pronouns come from. But the pronouns have been one of the most persistent parts of speech which have maintained the case forms. And there are several classes of pronouns find in Koine Greek. Uh, here's some of the classes then, and I'll give them to you. And I, I don't know if you have them down in your notes. Just write down the, the classes if, if they're not in your notes. I think I have most of them classified for you. Do you have personal, possessive? Okay, so you have the ideas there, but if you want to write these down and get the different classifications, we'll come back and look more at, at the pronouns, but this is just to introduce them to you. So we have the personal ones, ego, hemes, su, humes, so I, we, right, you, singular, you, plural. Unfortunately, we don't have the these and, these and thous anymore. King Jimmy went new. <laughs> we lost them all. And there is good. It was good that we had that. It's unfortunate we lost that in English, right? We just use you for both singular and plural, and it can be confusing sometimes. So we have personal pronouns. There are some that, that existed in Attic, Greek, and Nionic, and so on, but they're not carried over in the New Testament. So you'll notice you have ego, I. Paul uses this one often for emphasis, and we'll see a few examples of that, where he'll, he'll, he'll intensify or add some emphasis, and usually it's about his ministry, with which I was entrusted, I, right, Paul. And, and depending on the context, and you have to weigh by the context, why is he being emphatic that way? Sometimes it's just humility, right? I can't, uh, me, Paul, who persecuted the church, right? So you see that, but there are other thoughts, so I'm going to give you some ideas. Hey, Mace, we, and then Sue, you, and then who, Mace? But then we have autos, which is for he, she, and it, the third person, okay? And then we have the possessive, and then the intensive, and autos is used for intensive. And you should have some pretty simple examples in your notes, so you can go back and look through those. <clears throat> Turn my normally end. 
Good. So here's some examples of autos, usually emphatic. And here I put he just to give you the idea, but it's Mark chapter 1, verse 8. And usually it's, it's going to be in tone. So here's the verse we know it. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we have autos here. And this is placed here for emphasis, and it is emphatic. And, and, and this is a sense in which it would be tonal as you read it. Right? So you'll see this in the Greek, and then you'll read it. So I baptize you in hudati, right? Hudati. But he, here's our particle, but he, autos, he will baptize you in pneumati, in spirit. So here is he already, baptise. He doesn't, he doesn't have to have autos here, right? So it's emphatic. He could have just left that off and it would have just been, and, but he, you, in the spirit, right? Baptize you in the spirit, but he adds this autos on there. So this is how it can be used, and autos is used frequently like this, to, to give emphasis or to intensify something. It, not necessarily always seen in the English, but, you know, get it in the Greek. So there is a, that, if you will, then that emphatic contrast between the hudati, water, and pneumati, spirit, right? And this is another case. So with, it's translated, with the spirit, the holy one. This is why I have problems with that, right? In the sphere of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I just tell you, that's how I translate it, and then I wrestle with it. Okay, It's easy to say with the Holy Spirit, right? But I'm just telling you, majority of the times, this is the preposition in, right? In the sphere of, right? So think there. If your mind can't come around to it, then fall back to with, right? But I'm going to tell you, your labors will pay off if you stay the other course. So it can be used then intensively. Autos can be used in all persons, genders, and numbers. Okay? So autos can be used in several different ways, far ranging. So its intensification can be used in so many different areas. Some examples. We can have autos ego. I myself, Romans 7.25. Okay? And just let these sit. Don't. Like I tell you, you have examples in your notes, so don't worry about it. We have John 4, 42. We ourselves have heard. So we have the, the verbal element, right? Here is I, and then we add autos under, and this is myself, right? So this adds on. So this is I here, ego, right? And then we have autos, I myself. And notice how it's placed to the four. It's before it, right? Emphatic position. Oftentimes we'll find this kind of phrasing with, with Christ. He himself is, Colossians 1.17. He himself and no other is, right? So that's how we would translate that, or he alone and no one else. So here we have, we ourselves have heard. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 36, the works themselves. So we can have this used in reference to a personal individual speaking of themselves. We can use it collectively in a group, or we can have it in reference to things, the works themselves, or nature itself. Hey, fusis, aute. And notice the, the different uh, positioning here, before, 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 here, after. 1 Corinthians 11.14. Sorry, not 111, but 11.14. Late typo. In Luke chapter 2, verse 38, at the hour itself, right? So here is the itself part, the hour, te ora, the hour. So I might find it translated at that very hour, right? Or at the hour, we could translate it at the hour, the same one, <coughs> right? But understand, it's intensified, right? So not just merely at, at the hour. At that same hour, right? Do something that brings that out in your mind's eye and just, right? So you understand there's emphasis there. And then ask yourself why it's emphatic, right? We also have demonstrative, okay, which is this and that. Hutas is your near. Ekanos is remote, right? This is... And remote, ekanos, that, over there, right? So one is near, the other one is distance. 
We have relatives, Haas, Hostis. So our articles were actually demonstrative pronouns. So they can be translated as relatives, which. So you'll look at, so that the righteousness, which, right, is through faith in Christ. We translate, that's a relative, but it's an article, tain. Because it came from demonstrative pronoun, it can be translated that way. So <clears throat> just, you know, I'll keep bringing that before your mind's eye, repetition, right? But you'll see that a lot. You'll see the article used as a relative pronoun. It'll also be used as a possessive pronoun. Okay? So 1 Timothy chapter 1, they shipwrecked the faith or their faith. It is articular form. Right? Did they shipwreck their faith? Did they lose their salvation? Or did they shipwreck in regards to the faith, that basis of right, Christian truth? So I'll just tell you, though, that then you're going to oh, get away the context, which is and so on. So I'll just let you know there's some exegetical difficulties that will come down the pike. Reflexives. Oh, I love reflexives. These are awesome. 1 Timothy 2.6, talking about Christ. The one who gave Deus, he gave himself, he'auton, himself, right? This is talking about our antilutron, redemption, uperpanton, upon half of all. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, same thing, reflexive pronoun. Who gave himself, this is a participle. New Town tells us that. Here's a reflexive. So basically you have Christ is functioning as high priest and sacrificial lamb. At the same time. He gave himself. Right? Substitutionary atonement. Voluntary. Right? Action. It's, I mean, seriously, we can probably pick off several doctrinal statements right there in verse 4 of chapter 1 from this. So reflexives are cool. But there's different ways to express that, and we'll see that later. So reciprocal and distributive, another kind of pronoun. We knew that we know the, the one another's, right? And they right, love one another, greet one another. So that's alilon. So alilon is the doubling of alas. Okay, so I'll show you something really cool about this alas. So alilon is just the doubling of that, but we know the one another's, right? Love one another, greet one another, and so on. We can have the idea, Koine Greek reflexive pronouns may be used as well as the middle voice. So Matthew 26, 4, they took counsel with one another. So in English, it's translated one another, but you have a reflexive instead of the reciprocal pronoun. So that's the beauty of the Greek, right? There's that variation, right? You can, depending on what you want to do, but then again, ask yourself, right? So that passage in Colossians, this is the one that's cool. So here's what's interesting, Galatians 1.6. So here's alas. This is that makes up the, the alelon. The distinction between alas, another, which has as its meaning another of the same kind, and then heteros, another of a different kind. This is observed in Galatians 1.6. Now it's not pressed in every situation, but then he goes on in verse 7, he says, which is not another. Okay, so he's making a play on the two. Right? So, alas, another of the same kind, heteros, another of a different kind. So, he says that you have gone off after a heteron, another gospel of a different kind. Then he goes on to explain which is not another of the same kind. In other words, there's one gospel, just one. Right? <clears throat> Here's what's cool about this particular term. And it's at the root of you'll alas, you find it in different aspects. This one, and we, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. So he talks about the fact that, and you once, pate, antas, and you once being estranged or alienated, right? And enemies in the mind. So this is interesting because this is a perfect participle, okay? And it's paraphrastic, but that doesn't matter. But here's what's interesting. Continuing state of alienation, but notice what it's based off of. Allah. Trios, belonging to another. So we were alienated from God, estranged from God, belonging to another, which was who? Satan, right? But we have been reconciled back. So when you, these little 
particles, right? And these little tiny words like alas, so many different ways they're used, right? It just start the building blocks of making up words. And there's just great rich truth that's there. This is another example that, that one, Colossians uh, 3.13, bearing with one another, right? So here we have alelon, this is our reciprocal. But then he goes on to say, and forgiving he'autois, right? Each other. This is our reflexive. And if you want to know the distinction, watch my <laughs> class from last week <laughs> or the week before, and uh, you'll see the, the significance of that. Then we have the interrogative, the indefinite, and then the alternative, alas heteras. So particles and pronouns, I, they're, they're rich usage. We can combine them together just like uh, other elements of Greek, just those building blocks and put them together and, and make up different terms. We get all that? All right, why don't we... Yeah, I'll end here. Why don't we end here? We'll stop at the personal pronouns. We'll come back next time and look at these. Um, <clears throat> I would tell you, if you're going to spend time on, work on the prepositions, getting those definitions down, right? And then the pronouns will come. <clears throat> pronouns are almost the kind of thing where you have to be working with the text, interacting with it. But I'll give you, next time, I'll give you uh, passages where you'll find a long string of them so you can spend some time getting to see how they work, right? Emphatic and so on. So I'll give you some uh, examples, and I'll put it in hard copy so you can add it to your notes. And I'll take some of these examples because I know they're probably not in your notes. So I'll take these from tonight's class too and put them on hard copy for you so you can have those with the particle in that.